live on Facebook. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in on hopefully what's not a snowy Friday everywhere, just at my house. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have the second EMTA license uh, out of the state of Virginia with us today. Dr. Craig, no, not a doctor, Craig Diatley. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. We are also having a minor technical difficulty. So Craig is going to be a talking black box with us today, but nonetheless, we have some fantastic stories and we're glad you are all here. If you have any questions for Craig as he's chatting, be sure to drop those into the feed here and we'll be sure to ask. Otherwise, let's kick it off. Walk, take it away. Good evening, everybody. Uh, here we are once again, and um, I am talking to a black box this evening with a CD on it. So that's Craig Diatley uh, with me. And um, Craig, glad to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. It's been fun to do this because I run into a lot of old friends and we, we rehash a lot of EMS history. What I'd like to do is, I know you're now a PA and you're, you're involved in emergency management out of MedStar up in Washington. I'd like to know how you got started because you were part of the world of EMS back in the dark ages. Tell me how you got going. Sure. Well, once upon a time, many decades ago, I was a young man that went off to college in a rural community called Prince Edward County, Virginia a college called Hampton, Sydney. And I, like uh, over half of my admitting freshman class of 200 gentlemen, were uh, pre-med. And halfway through my freshman year, one evening, my roommate and I were heading to the post office. And uh, there was this car stopped at a stop sign with the horn constantly blasting. And the closer we got to the car, Mike and I began to realize this was one of the most beloved English professors of the college. And when we got literally right next to him at the driver's door, we realized he wasn't responsive. We moved him back so the horn wasn't blasting anymore. And, and I stayed with Professor Romp while Mike went to a payphone to call for help. Well, in Prince Edward County, in fact, in much of Virginia in 1968, to call for help, there was no 911 to call. You called O for operator. And in Prince Edward County, when you called the operator for an ambulance, it turned out that you were going to be transferred to one of the seven funeral homes that serviced the area. And this particular day was a Tuesday, and Tuesday was shorter funeral homes turn. And he had the reputation of being the upscale funeral uh, director in the community. And that meant in part that he updated his Cadillac hearse slash ambulances every couple of years. And so he took the call, understood there was an unconscious, unresponsive individual. And so he threw the red light uh, rotating bulb on the top of the hearse and off he came to, uh, to our campus and we heard his siren. And when he pulled up, he got out of the ambulance and he was the only one who got out. He came over to us, Mike and I, he, he looked was at the, us. He was the crew, right, Greg? He, he, he was the crew, that's exactly <laughs> right. He looked at us, he looked at Professor Rop, and then he looked back at Mike and I and he said, I remember it to this day, he don't look good, does he, boys? Give me a hand. So Mike went over to help him pull out his stretcher out of the back. And all three of us loaded Professor Rop onto the stretcher and ultimately back into this purse slash ambulance. And off old man Shorter went. To this day, I can't tell you whether he went the 25 minutes or so to Southside Community Hospital or he went the 15 to 20 minutes closer to the shorter funeral home. But that was the last day that Professor Rock was alive, for sure. That piqued an Either interest. Either way, the guy driving the ambulance made out. 
that's it. He, he didn't have to do anything except know the way home. <laughs> that started an interest that led next to um, the Virginia legislation resulted in a rules change that forbid funeral homes from either being a funeral home or a rescue squad. They could be one or the other. They couldn't be both. And so a year or so later, the Prince Edward County Volunteer Rescue Squad was formed. By the time I was the beginning of my junior year, I joined that organization looking to try and make a difference in a small way. I got, at the time, my uh, American Red Cross basic and advanced first aid course instruction and had the badges proudly sewn to my, uh, my white flight suit, if you will. And anytime I wasn't in class and I wasn't otherwise occupied with doing schoolwork, I was at the rescue squad taking calls. Calls that range from the typical heart attack, to stroke, to injury, to accident. But among the things that I came to appreciate in writing there as compared to later in my career is this was a rural community. And I can remember going on calls where it was 30 minutes for us to get to the incident address. And it was that long or in some cases even longer before you got to a hospital. And in some cases we didn't go to Southside, we went all the way into the city of Richmond to one of the big university hospitals. But after doing that for two years, and oh yeah, also helping to start the Hampton Sydney Volunteer Fire Department, which was unique because they would run to support the ambulance, whereas the Prince Edward County Fire Department would not run to support their uh, rescue squad colleagues. Mm -hmm. I had a great couple of final years that really led me to further solidify a desire. Just lost you, Craig. Stand by, folks. We'll get him back. I'm teaching, and the other one... There you are. Was Sorry, in... Craig, you dropped out for about 30 seconds. Yep. Can you hear me now again? Yeah, gotcha just fine. Yep. Thanks. So when I graduated from college and came back home, I worked two full-time jobs, one as a substitute teacher on a regular daily basis, and I got a job um, as an intensive care technician. But I also, at that point, joined the Annandale Volunteer Fire Department as a, uh, as a volunteer. The senior year of my college education resulted not only in my getting the college degree that my parents wanted, but equally important to me at the time was I graduated having taken either the first or the second, it remains somewhat in dispute, EMT course offered in the Commonwealth of Virginia using the original infamous Orange Book yep. published by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, which was really the Bible that our EMS profession grew to uh, evolve from. So graduating as an EMT, I came home, joined the Annandale Volunteer Fire Department. And when I wasn't teaching, when I wasn't working nights in the intensive care unit, I was lending my uh, newfound skill set on the back of an ambulance as a volunteer. There you go. And I think we all got our start uh, when formal EMS education started. I think we all started training EMTs with the AAOS Orange Book, as it's become to be known. Yep. Um, and then subsequent to that, because Nancy Caroline had been out in Pittsburgh with Peter Safar, um, then we had emergency care in the street emerge, and that then became something of the standard for paramedic programs. Um, yep, that's that's what we used uh, to begin training our paramedics here in Fairfax County, which I was in the first class of those, yep. and then not only helped teach that same class that I was taking, but subsequently helped to teach classes that followed for several years thereafter. Sure. And that then introduced not only the importance of the EMT, but now the advanced life support provider beginning as a cardiac care technician and then evolving yep. into the full-blown uh, EMTP 
that we know so much about these days. Yeah, and that was in, in Virginia, you had that three-step process, EMT, cardiac care technician, and then uh, paramedic. And I know where I cut my teeth, it was EMT, then EMT intermediate. Immediate, yep. And then paramedic. Um, so yeah, all the states had their own way of doing things, but it was interesting to see that progression. So... How did you move from EMS into becoming a PA? Oh, great question. Well, if you remember, I mentioned I went to school to be uh, pre-med and I did all the requisite classes, but my GPA just wasn't enough to get me into medical school. But I had this wonderful physician, family physician, who knew of my interest and, and, and deep desire. And he said, well, look, let's try it another way. He said, I don't know much about this new profession, but it could be an inroads. So why don't you go apply to a PA school, complete that education, and then with that behind you, then go reapply to medical school. So I did what I discourage anyone from doing these days, and that is I applied. That wasn't to be discouraged, but I applied to only one PA school. And that was the George Washington University School of Medicine program, which was one of the first five programs in the country. And fortunately for me, I got in and I was in their second graduating class. And uh, that was in 1975. And two days after graduating, I went into the emergency department as the university hospital's first PA. And my career both as an EMS um, clinician and as a PA, just nobody has had a more blessed career between the two than I. I was with the university uh, as a PA in the ER for five years. And then um, at the urgent request of my uh, department chair, he asked me to go become the director of the PA program for five years. I still maintain my EMS connection but uh, worked only weekends in a suburban ER while I was the PA program director. And then when I finished directing that program, accomplishing the goals that the two of us had agreed to, I went back to the ER and in total spent the first 28 years of my career at George Washington University. And it was during that same time that I had the opportunity to start the EMS degree program one of the first of its kind in the country and was joined by some others, at least one of whom, Glenn Lutke, I know that you all have interviewed and talked to before. Glenn was a critical component to both the origination, but also the success of that particular program that we're both proud of. Yep. But it also uh, lent itself to my being introduced to um, doing contract instruction that was another critical part of the EMS program at the time. It wasn't just the degree aspect, it was contract education. And we were fortunate enough to uh, win the contract several times to do all of the uh, certification, recertification education for a number of area fire and EMS departments, including Fairfax County. And while it was, uh, while we were doing one of those contracts, I was uh, challenged one day by a member of the Fairfax County Police Department who was their chief flight paramedic. And Rachel Carrico said, hey, we've got a problem and maybe you can help us with it. And this was in 1991. And at about that time, the police department in Fairfax County had, had paired up for a number of years with a nurse from the Fairfax Hospital to operate the program called ARIES, Air Rescue Intensive Emergency Services, or A-R-I-E-S. And that program is highly successful. In fact, it grew to the point where the hospital wanted to, to do more than the police department was willing to do because it was supposed to be a police and medevac helicopter, not just a medevac helicopter. Yep. So Fairfax pulled out the nurse and joined that nurse with either another nurse or a paramedic 
in what became the air care program, while Ray's challenge to me was to help him create the Fairfax County Police Helicopter Division. So he, uh, he made me the proverbial offer too good to turn down. I accepted it with two stipulations. I didn't care that it was a volunteer gig. I was used to that. But I said, number one, if I'm going to help you, it's my way. And number two, if I'm going to help you learn how to care for patients in the helicopter, then I'm going to be doing it with you. So I'm flying. I'm not a classroom jock. And so it was that understanding that led to in March of 1991, while still with the fire department and working at GW, I took on another exciting opportunity that I'm still doing to this day, and that's being an assistant medical director for the Fairfax County Police Department, where we still have that medevac program. We've also grown a program that not only has paramedics now um, providing aeromedical service, but we have some of those same paramedics supporting our specialty teams, SWAT, CDU, Marine Patrol, uh, et cetera, as well. Right. So as I said, I, I took simply a, 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 a shorter funeral home response and turned it into a wonderfully exciting and most enjoyable career. Very cool. Now, do you guys do just rotorcraft or do you do fixed wing and rotorcraft? Nope, just rotorcraft. We okay. have two uh, Bell 429 helicopters and nice. it's uh, that's the mission and that's the uh, aircraft that we fly. Yeah, that's a nice helicopter. It's got some room in the back. It does. Yeah. It does, particularly yeah. compared to the earlier aircraft yeah. that we started to uh, to use. Yeah, my early days were in the back of a B0105 and you couldn't stand up very much. Then. <laughs> yeah, well, get in the back of a Bell Jet Ranger and you might have had more room than you thought yep. in your aircraft compared to ours. Yeah. Now, what um, other than those educational and management responsibilities, what what has changed now that we're dealing with COVID for your situation and what you're doing? Boy, what hasn't changed from from <laughs> fr from a clinician's perspective, you know, seeing patients in the emergency department, um, it was all about knowing what to do for the patient, while at the same time taking extra precautions to protect yourself and the other um, clinicians and non-clinicians that you were working with. Yeah. That has been intensive from the outset and sustained from the beginning. And we're not used to that. I mean, you know, we train uh, personnel in the ED, for example, to, to wear PPE to do patient decontamination. But the expectation there is that you may be in a suit for 15 or 20, maybe 30 minutes at most, and then you're rotated out if there's still more decon to be done. In this particular case, we never had trained individuals to work in the level of PPE, whether yep. it's powered air purifying respirators or double masking with the N95 with a surgical mask combination with a face shield. This has been its own new experience, not just how to manage the situation clinically, but how to manage it safely. Um, Agreed. You know, and it's, second, it's, it's interesting. I did a lot of training in this part of the state of Florida on PPE during Ebola six years ago. Yep. And I was astounded at how much healthcare workers had forgotten about donning and doffing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you stick him in a papper and holy smokes, there's a different environment. And I keep thinking back to the early days when you and I were young paramedics, we started an IV, we didn't even have gloves on. I mean, no, sir. You know, no gloves, no glasses, no, no and, nothing. And, and, and we washed our hands when we went home. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what do you see as the future for the young EMS folks today, Craig? Well, clearly, I think we all can agree that the, the, the calls for service aren't going down. There are some changes in the types of calls for service. We certainly have more as an example, opioid overdoses than you and I probably ever had to yeah. run at yep. the beginning. Uh, number two, there's still infectious diseases. You know, For you and I at the outset, probably one of the most challenging situations was to deal with the HIV patient. 
which yeah. I can remember very clearly from an EMS perspective and more so from a hospital perspective, I can remember some clinicians just refused to treat them because there was such a fear uh, of contagion associated with that diagnosis. Um, So we'll still face infectious emerging diseases for sure. I think a third is um, the whole idea of how inviting, how exciting and how sustainable is this profession going to be um, to individuals that are going to succeed you and I? My, one of my biggest concerns is because of the intensity um, of the job, and particularly when you're running a lot of calls within your 10, 12, or 24 hour shift, and it's day after day intensity, um, there is not just a physical hardship, but there is a psychological hardship. And I know we all have peer support and you and I will remember when we had CISD teams, et cetera. But I truly hope that our, uh, our young, younger EMS colleagues, as well as our older colleagues too, are availing themselves of that situation uh, with some degree of regularity because that's the only way that you're going to avoid responder fatigue when you're doing a lot of intensive or extensive and or repetitive responding. Yeah, I'm fortunate enough to be part of a CISM team down here. All we deal with is first responders. But the one thing that concerns me, and I don't know if this has ever crossed your mind, we encounter in a lot of departments what they call EAP, Employee Assistance Programs. Yeah. And I'm always concerned about how much the youngsters are going to open up to those people because those are their peers in the same department. And I'm always wondering if in the back of their minds, they're just going to end up in their jacket um, and have an impact on the future, their future with the department. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that um, if, if I'm going to be totally comfortable in talking about how I feel, I need to have absolute assurances that what I say is between me and the listener and that it doesn't get recorded. It doesn't get judged. It doesn't get acted upon other than to make sure that I have the support that that conversation may lead the clinician to thinking is what's needed for me, whether it's continuing sessions, whether it's uh, hypnosis, whether it's yoga, whether it's even the rare case medication, whatever, there has to be a sense of trust and confidence Absolutely. in any relationship. And, and this is no exception to that rule. Absolutely. So what does the future hold for you, Craig? Great, trying to get past COVID like everybody else. I'm excited about a new biocontainment unit that's being built or soon will be built at the MedStar Washington Hospital Center to uh, give us more uh, capacity to care for any emerging infectious disease beyond what we have now, which in part requires that we take uh, about 40% of our ER and take it offline for the care of one or maybe two patients. The new BCU, we will be able to take care of a more significant number of patients and not affect the emergency department functioning. And then I guess the third thing is to try and figure out how I can retire and not annoy the heck out of my wife who's been retired already for four years. Got it. The biocontainment unit, is that a negative pressure facility and so forth with all the bells and whistles? Yes, sir. It, it uh, It will be what we anticipate uh, as a state-of-the-art system, uh, we've, we've had a number of different types of engineers. We've had frequent conversation with some of the, our colleagues in the bullet treatment centers across the, uh, the United States. We've had conversations with NETEC, who, as you know, is, is the ASPR-supported uh, yep. uh, super expertise yep. uh, in the country to assist everyone, including, by the way, EMS agencies, um, if they call and ask. Um, so yeah, it, it'll be a, a wonderful advancement. 
You just threw out an acronym. Some of the people may not know what it is. ASPR is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, Craig and I are both involved with that particular group of folks in one way or another. Um, that sounds very exciting. How many patients are you going to be able to accommodate in that unit? Well, it depends upon how we want to use it. Part of the, the importance of hospital design today is that you can't afford any area that just sits around for that yeah. once in a lifetime situation. <laughs> so it's a 15 bed unit Got for it. being for observation of nearby ED patients. It's a seven bed respiratory isolation unit. If we have, for example, an outbreak of TB or it will be a two bed biocontainment unit, uh, most especially for those extreme situations. Great, cool, sounds exciting. Any parting words of wisdom, my friend? Boy, um, I can only hope that those that are listening to our conversation today can have half the fun, half the excitement and half the success at least that you and I have had as uh, being at the beginning of, in my case, not simply the evolution of the EMS profession, but I should have mentioned that a funny story related to being one of the early PAs in the country was the first patient that I saw on my first day at the GWED was a man who was obviously short of breath, probably in congestive heart failure. And so I went in and introduced myself as, hi, my name is Craig, I'm a PA. PA, I'm here to help you. And with his halting breath and with his, uh, his uh, oxygen saturation declining, he said, son, I, I don't need a public attorney. I need a doctor. <laughs> My how not only EMS, but the PA profession has grown oh, yeah. in the period of time as well. Absolutely. Great, my friend. Great getting reacquainted with you again. You and I talked Likewise. earlier, and we still don't remember when the last time was we saw each other. But it's terrific getting with you, getting together with you. The uh, good news, Dick, is that we can remember it was at least once in time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Have a great evening, Craig. Thanks again. You too. Thank you all. Yeah. Stay safe. Bye bye. So long, Christy. Over to you, my dear. Thank you, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Doc. Um, we have a fun double header tonight. If uh, you go to scroll further down on the Facebook page, um, there should be an event link where you can register for our evening history chat lecture with Vice President Mike Williams tonight in like a couple hours. Uh, so click that link right away. RSVP your spot. Um, our partners at the Aurora Regional Fire Museum will be hosting it. And I'm gonna give a big shout out to Brian who's done a lot of coordinating, um, getting our exhibits installed and this program up and going. And he's going to kill me if we get 20 more registrations tonight. So go click that link. Uh, let's fill the house. And otherwise, um, that's it. I'm super excited that we have nonstop programming tonight. I'm gonna need a second cup of coffee. So uh, we'll take a quick break and circle back the next session again, hosted by the Aurora Regional Fire Museum. So either check out their first Facebook page, our Facebook page, if you're having problems, get in, um, shoot me a message on Facebook and we'll make sure you get the proper link to get into that. Otherwise, uh, that is it. Coffee's up in a couple of weeks with um, shoot. You're gonna test me on this. It's Todd Stout, uh, First Watch on Friday, and I can't remember who's on Saturday. It might be um, former board member Rick Nerad, uh, up, but don't quote me on it. Check our <laughs> event page or our, our I'm posting. I'm not sure this. either, Christy. <laughs> Too many things going on. We also have some other fun stuff happening over the weekend. Um, we'll kind of share it out on social as things progress. But right. uh, that's it for now. We'll see you in a couple yeah. hours. See you later, everybody.